Today we're going to be looking at chapter 20, part B, and we're still looking at the immune system. We're now looking at the third line of defense, or the adaptive immune system, which is a specific defensive system that eliminates almost any pathogen or abnormal cell in the body. You know, activities of the adaptive immune system include the amplification of the inflammatory response, the activation of complement, but there is a shortcoming to the adaptive immune system. Yes, it's specific, but it must be primed. It must be primed by initial exposure before it can respond to a specific foreign substance. It is primed by an initial exposure to that foreign substance, but then the generation of the effector cells like plasma cells and cytotoxic T cells or helper T cells, that priming takes time. Other characteristics of the adaptive immune system, other than that it's specific, is that it's systemic. It's not restricted to initial site. It has memory. It mounts an even stronger attack to known antigens. And we know there's two main branches of the adaptive defense system, the humoral and cellular arm of the adaptive defense system. The humoral arm produces antibodies. These antibodies are produced from B lymphocytes that have turned into plasma cells. So let's be clear there, plasma cells produce antibodies, but plasma cells are derived from B lymphocytes. These antibodies circulate freely in the body fluids and are able to bind temporarily to target cells. They can temporarily inactivate these target cells via opsonization, or that opsonization can serve as a way to mark the microbe for destruction by phagocytes or even complement. Humoral immunity is also associated with extracellular targets like bacteria. The cellular arm of the adaptive defense system is going to use T lymphocytes. These T lymphocytes, when they're activated, become effectors like T cytotoxic cells, which directly kill infected cells, or T helper cells, which by releasing chemicals that enhance inflammatory responses or activate other lymphocytes or macrophages, are able to help out other parts of the immune system. Cellular immunity is also associated with intracellular targets like viruses. Antigens themselves are just substances that can mobilize an adaptive immune response. They can provoke not only an immune response, but can provoke different types of immune response because they contain generally different antigenic determinants. They can be complete or incomplete antigens. And they they're generally the targets of all adaptive immune responses antigens are. Most antigens are large, they're complex molecules, ones that are not normally found in the body. Foreign antigens are also non-self antigens. But be aware that some antigens can be self antigens. The antigens on body cells that are supposed to be in an individual's body are actually self antigens, and more on that later. Let's talk more about the fact that antigens can be complete or incomplete. Incomplete antigens are called haptins, whereas our complete antigens have two important functional properties, immunogenicity and reactivity. Haptins don't have that unless they bind to the body's own proteins. Immunogenicity is the ability to stimulate proliferation of specific lymphocytes, essentially the ability not only to activate lymphocytes, but to cause an immune reaction that leads to the generation of effector cells. Reactivity is the ability to react with the activated lymphocytes and antibodies released by the immunogenic reactions. So essentially reactivity is just the ability to interact with these activated effector lymphocytes. Examples of complete antigens include foreign proteins, polysaccharides, lipids, and nucleic acids. They're really seen on many foreign invaders such as pollen and microorganisms. Incomplete antigens, also called haptins, involve molecules too small to be seen, so they're not immunogenic and they're not reactive. Examples include small peptides, nucleotides, and even some hormones. And they may become immunogenic if the haptin attaches to the body's own proteins, because it's the combination of body's own protein plus haptin that could then be seen as foreign and therefore immunogenic. That would cause the immune system to mount an attack that is possibly harmful to a person because it attacks not just the haptin, but the self protein as well. Examples of this would be poison ivy, animal dander, detergents, and cosmetics. Antigenic determinants are just parts of an antigen. An antigen can have many antigenic determinants and most are naturally occurring. Most naturally occurring antigens have numerous antigen determinants that are able to mobilize different types of lymphocyte populations and form different kinds of antibodies against them.
The large, chemically simple molecules such as plastics or even some metals have little or no immunogenicity, so we wouldn't see that chem chemicals or materials that are used in surgeries tending to be antigenic determinants. So that's why they would be used, because they're not as complex and varied as we see for antigens in their antigenic determinants. Here in figure 20.7, we see an antigen with three different antigenic determinants, and they have three different antibodies binding to each antigenic determinant. But we also want to talk about self-antigens. All cells are covered with a variety of proteins located on their cell surface, and these are not antigenic to self. But they may be antigenic to others if we were to give someone a transfusion or a graft from a donor to a recipient if we didn't match the self-antigens. The major histocompatibility complex, or MHC, is a group of genes that encode proteins on the cell surface that have an important role in the immune response. And their main role is really as antigen presentation, where MHC molecules display peptide fragments for recognition by appropriate T cells. Now, if these peptide fragments are from an individual's own cells, then those are self-antigens. Whereas if these peptide fragments are abnormal or from a foreign antigen, then we would say that they are non-self antigens. So again, one set of important self proteins are just that group of glycoproteins that we're calling MHC protein, which stands for major, histocompat major histocompatibility complex. And they're unique to each individual. That's why it could be difficult in a transfusion or graft to just give any type of organ to any type of recipient. So from donor to recipient, you would need to match MHC and blood type. We know that the MHC proteins contain a groove that can hold a piece of self antigen or foreign antigen. That would be the peptide fragment that it would choose to display. And T lymphocytes are able to recognize antigens that are presented on MHC proteins only. So we need these MHC proteins in order for T lymphocytes to work. If it was an abnormal protein sitting in the MHC, that would be something that would be attacked by, say, a cytotoxic T cell. The adaptive immune system involves three crucial types of cells. That would be the B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, and the antigen-presenting cells. There are three different types of antigen-presenting cells, and we'll make sure to lay those out. B lymphocytes are also called B cells, T lymphocytes are also called T cells, and B cells are associated with humoral immunity, whereas T cells are associated with cellular immunity. Antigen presenting cells do exactly that. They present antigens to things like B cells and T cells, but they don't respond to specific antigens. Instead, they're playing kind of alternative role or an auxiliary role in immunity. So since we're looking at the different types of cells that are used in the adaptive defense system, let's also talk about the development of lymphocytes, their maturation and activation. T and B lymphocytes share a common development in steps in their life cycles. They both originate in the red bone marrow. So the origin of T and B lymphocytes is the red bone marrow. However, their maturation differs because even though lymphocytes are educated in a two to three day process and mature in primary lymphoid organs, B cells mature in the red bone marrow and T cells mature in the thymus. Lymphocytes in general, however, are educated for two reasons, for immunocompetence and self tolerance. We wanna make sure that lymphocytes are able to recognize only one specific antigen. So B or T cells that display only one unique type of antigen receptor on a surface when they're mature, those would be chosen for. We'd want those because we'd want to make sure that B or T lymphocytes only bind to one specific antigen. Self tolerance is a test wherein lymphocytes must be unresponsive to their own antigens. For example, we wouldn't want a B lymphocyte to recognize a self antigen or something that was supposed to be in the human body and attack it. Next, they're seeding the secondary lymphoid organs in circulation. This is a step wherein mature and then immunocompetent B and T lymphocytes that have not yet been exposed to their specific antigens, so technically are naive, then go to secondary lymphoid organs. So they're gonna travel from primary to secondary lymphoid organs. And this movement is called seeding or colonizing the secondary lymphoid organs. 
Secondary lymphoid organs include lymph nodes and spleens, among others. Seeding the secondary lymphoid organs would increase the chance of encounter with the antigen by these naive B and T lymphocytes. And then there's antigen encounter and activation. When the naive T and B lymphocytes do finally encounter their one specific antigen, that would trigger the lymphocyte to develop further. It would be selected to differentiate, which is a word that means change, into an active cell, and that would occur by binding to its specific antigen. Once it's bound to a specific antigen and differentiated, then it will be selected to clone itself or proliferate. So if all the signals are present, the lymphocyte not only will differentiate, but then it will clone itself. So that proliferation differentiation step takes time. Once selected and activated, the lymphocyte proliferates. It forms an army of exact copies of itself, so essentially clones. And most of the clones become effector cells. For B lymphocytes, effector cells are plasma cells. Plasma cells secrete antibodies. For T lymphocytes, the effectors are T regulatory cells, T cytotoxic cells, and T helper cells. And they can either directly or indirectly attack intracellularly infected cells. But effector cells fight infection. But there will be a few of the lymphocytes that remain as memory cells, but most of those clones, again, are becoming effector cells. The memory cells are able to respond to that same antigen the next time an individual encounters that specific antigen. So second or subsequent encounters with an antigen can be much stronger because of memory cells. And B and T memory cells and effector T cells circulate continuously. So the steps of lymphocyte development, maturation, and activation are origin, maturation, seeding, antigen encounter and activation, and then proliferation and differentiation. Again, both B and T lymphocytes originate in the red bone marrow. The thymus is the location for the maturation of T cells, whereas the red bone marrow is the location for the maturation of B cells. Secondary lymphoid organs include structures like lymph nodes and the spleen, and seeding secondary lymphoid organs would increase the chance that naive immunocompetent T and B cells would encounter their one specific antigen. When T and B lymphocytes do encounter their one specific antigen, then they would be activated. They would be activated by differentiating into their effector cell. Once they differentiated into their effector cell, they would begin cloning themselves, and they may differentiate slightly more to create memory cells. But the activated lymphocytes that proliferate or multiply and then differentiate into effector cells and memory cells are the ones that fight infection. Let's also talk about antigen receptor diversity. So this is a receptor that binds to the one specific antigen. It's the genes of an individual, not the antigens themselves, that determine which foreign substances the immune system will recognize. And there's a variety of immune cell receptors. They're all the result of the acquired genetic knowledge of microbes. So there's about 25,000 different genes that code for up to a billion different types of lymphocyte antigen receptors. Essentially, these genes create proteins that are just kind of shifted back and forth. So we get a huge variety of receptors because of this shifting and recombination, wherein gene segments are shuffled around and result in many combinations. During lymphocyte education, and especially during maturation, T cells mature, we know, in the thymus, but under a couple of different processes. There are both negative and positive selection pressures, or tests. The positive selection process is going to look for T cells that are capable of recognizing self-MHC proteins. We've mentioned before that T cells can only recognize self and non-self antigens when they're presented on MHC proteins. This is called MHC restriction. There's a restriction to the recognition of T cells to their specific antigen. Those that aren't able to recognize MHC are destroyed by apoptosis. A negative selection process is going to prompt apoptosis of T cells that bind to self antigens. Because yes, we want T cells to bind to MHC, but we don't want them to bind to MHC and self antigens. We only want them to bind to MHC and non-self antigens. This process, which is a negative selection process, is called clonal deletion. And we would get rid of any T cells by apoptosis that bound to self antigens displayed by self-MHC.
We'd want to ensure that there is no self-tolerant, that there is self-tolerance. So here is the positive selection and negative selection process. This is figure 20.9 in your lecture textbook. So it's T-cell education in the thymus. We want to ensure that T-cells recognize the major histocompatibility proteins, but that they not recognize the self-antigens. So we don't want them to recognize the self-antigens. We want them to be self-tolerant. We don't want them to bind to self-antigens. We want them to bind to non-self-antigens. And any T cells that don't get through these two selection processes will be deleted via apoptosis. Next, we're going to look at the antigen presenting cells. The antigen presenting cells include the dendritic cells, macrophages, and B cells. And if I have to include or pick one of those cells that is the best antigen presenting cell, it would be definitely the dendritic cell. Antigen presenting cells, or APCs, are able to engulf antigens and present fragments of antigens to T cells for recognition. So they do exactly what their name suggests. They're going to be able to present antigens, primarily to lymphocytes. Dendritic cells, for example, are found in connective tissues and the epidermis. So they're able to act as kind of mobile sentinels of boundary tissues. They phagocytose pathogens that enter tissues. They kind of break them up. And when they enter lymphatics to present antigens to T cells in a lymph node, they do so by placing these pieces of antigens that they've broken up on MHC proteins. Dendritic cells are the most effective antigen presenter known, so they're a key link between the innate and adaptive immune systems. So here is a dendritic cell. We can see that it kind of looks like a macrophage, but it has even more extensions. Macrophages are also an antigen presenting cell. They're also widely distributed in connective tissues, but they're found as well around lymphoid organs. They present antigens to T cells, which not only activates T cells, but could also further activate the macrophage. So a macrophage is not only interested in activating T cells, but also making themselves an even better macrophage because activated macrophages become voracious phagocytic killers. Also, this can trigger powerful inflammatory responses that recruit additional defenses to a site of infection. B lymphocytes are antigen presenting cells, but they're not really interested in activating naive T cells. They're much more interested in essentially their own activation. So they present antigens to helper T cells to assist in their own activation, which can then lead to differentiation and proliferation. So if we look here at an overview of the B and T lymphocytes, we can compare kind of different characteristics. For example, the B lymphocytes are associated with the humoral immune system. The T lymphocytes are associated with the cellular immune system. The B lymphocytes are known to turn into plasma cells, which then secrete antibodies. That's not the case for the T lymphocytes. The primary target of antibodies tends to be extracellular pathogens, whereas the primary target of activated T lymphocytes tends to be intracellular pathogens. The site of origin for both B and T lymphocytes is the red bone marrow. The B lymphocytes stay in the red bone marrow for maturation, whereas the T lymphocytes travel to the thymus for maturation. The effector cells for the humoral arm of the immune system are plasma cells. The effector cells for the cell-mediated arm of the adaptive immune system are cytotoxic T cells, helper T cells, and regulatory T cells. And both B and T lymphocytes, when activated, can form memory cells. So we're going to stop there for right now. Make sure to watch the next part of this part where we look closer at the humoral immune response, and specifically how antibodies are helpful in fighting infection.